This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. The FCPA Compliance Report is the longest-running podcast in compliance, engaging a wide variety of compliance-related guests and topics. Each week, Tom Fox brings you the top commentators and information which will inform your compliance program going forward. Join us again for the top podcast in compliance, hosted by the voice of compliance, Tom Fox. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Welcome to the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, we take a deep dive into the French portion of the Airbus settlement with Brian Silliman, managing partner at the Paris offers of Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed. We take a look at the facts around the French settlement. We consider some of the legal issues unique to France, including the blocking statute. We also take a look at the unique monitorship or oversight that the PNF placed over Airbus. It's a fascinating deep dive into the biggest French anti-corruption enforcement action ever. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Brian Silliman. Brian is known to listeners of this podcast. I've had him on before. He is the managing partner at Hughes, Hubbard & Reed in the Paris office. And we're today going to talk about the French portion of the Airbus settlement. Uh, Before we get going, uh, I would note that Hughes Hubbard, uh, uh, Airbus is a client of Hughes Hubbard, and everything we're going to talk about is already in the public record, so we're not going to get any uh, inside information from Brian. So Brian, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, first of all, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you. Pleasure Pleasure to be with you. So, Brian, uh, I think uh, many of our listeners may not know uh, or understand the French enforcement regime around Sapondu or uh, any of the French anti-corruption laws. So I was wondering if you could describe the French enforcement authorities and the law under which they investigated Airbus and then issued the judicial public interest agreement with Airbus. Sure. So the the, the entity that took the lead in the prosecution is what's referred to as the, the PNF. That stands for the, the Parquet National Financier. Uh, there are prosecutors spread across France in different jurisdictions, but the, the PNF uh, is a central unit of the prosecuting agency that, that focuses on complex uh, financial and corruption matters, um, particularly ones that have an international component like this. Uh, this one obviously did, uh, and so they took the lead in prosecuting the company for the for the French. Um, they were assisted by a unit of the police judiciaire. So there's a uh, the police uh, have a, a judicial unit that does investigations of crime, and there's a department of the judicial police that focuses on financial crimes. Uh, and so you see them referenced as well in the prosecution documents it's called O'Cliff. Um, they assisted in gathering evidence uh, relating to the, the corruption. Um, in terms of the, the legal provisions, so the company was prosecuted um, and charged with violating two different um, portions of the French penal code, uh, one that deals with corruption uh, and one that deals with corruption of public officials. So there are actually two distinct um, uh, articles under the French Penal Code. But the the prosecution itself was um, done using this uh, relatively new uh, mechanism called the CGIP, using the French acronym, the Convention Judiciaire d'Intérêt Public, or the Judicial Public Interest Agreement, which was created out of the law of Sapandu in late 2016. And the, the closest equivalent is a, a deferred prosecution agreement in the US or the UK. So until this mechanism had been created, there wasn't this opportunity uh, for companies like Airbus to have a, a negotiated resolution. Uh, and this is the means through which they were able to resolve the issues with the French. Brian, I think many of our listeners are going to be aware that there was a simultaneously uh, 
uh, announced resolution with the Serious Fraud Office in the United Kingdom and the Department of Justice in the United right. States. And both the UK authorities and the American authorities referred to something called the French blocking statute. Uh, our listeners may not know what that is, so I was wondering if you could uh, describe what the French blocking statute is, how it came into play in this case, and why it was so critical that France take, if not the lead, a very significant role in the investigation of this matter. Sure. So the blocking statute is is something, you're right, that's referred to often, um, but but not always fully understood. It's actually um, existed in France for many years. It was passed in the late 1960s, in 1968. And the the idea was to control the flow of sensitive information outside of France, particularly information um, that was either sensitive from an economic uh, or security perspective, but also um, information that could be used uh, as proof in foreign, that is, you know, non-French uh, judicial or enforcement proceedings. Um, and so what that means is when there's uh, an investigation that involves um, non-French authorities, but includes French materials, um, such information is supposed to pass through um, a, a request from government to government, uh, what's called a mutual legal assistance treaty request, um, which allows the French government to see what's being communicated to other authorities. Um, so in the context of uh, a multi-jurisdictional investigation and prosecution like this one, what that meant in practice, and this is cited in the the CGIP documents is that um, documentation, and there was a significant amount of documentation produced by the company, was produced to the PNF, uh, which then in turn shared uh, what they believed was appropriate with their counterparts in the SFO uh, or the DOJ. Brian, what was the... Um or I guess I should ask, was this or do you view this as a milestone in French anti-corruption investigation and enforcement? Or did you just see this as a natural outgrowth of uh, where the French were going with Sapontu and some of their other pronouncements around anti-corruption? I, I do think it's a milestone. I think it's a milestone for, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, the, the magnitude in and of itself, which has been uh, getting a lot of attention is, is quite significant. Um, but I think more so um, from the French perspective, while this is not the first um, CGIP that has been entered into, it's, it's also not the first CGIP that's been entered into jointly uh, with a, a foreign counterpart that was Societe Generale. Um, it's, I think, perceived as the first one where the French really took the lead. Uh, and you see that not just in the, the portion of the financial recovery that the French um, recovered versus their foreign counterparts, but also, you know, there was a much stronger jurisdictional nexus to the conduct that France had vis-a-vis uh, -vis its U.S. and U.K. counterpart. And I think um, it was important for the French authorities to, to have this type of, of resolution um, and demonstrates that they're really uh, capable and, and willing to bring these type of large-scale prosecutions with their foreign uh, counterparts. Brian, the numbers in this case were simply mind-boggling. Uh, in U.S. dollars, nearly $3.9 billion. But I was wondering if you could uh, walk us through the final penalty, which was assessed by the French court for the French component of the Airbus settlement. Sure. So you're right. The 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 size is, is really quite shocking. Um, the, on the French side, the um, French portion amounts to overall um, fines and penalties of around 2.1 billion euros. Um, there's a, a breakdown of that in the, the charging document, in the CGIP document. Um, about half of it is comprised of what was um, identified as the illicit profit that was received from the contracts that were cited uh, in the documents. Um, the other half is a penalty amount. And the penalty amount was arrived at by taking into account various factors, some of which were 
uh, aggravating factors and some of which were mitigating factors. Um, on the aggravating side, you had, uh, for example, the nature and the duration of the conduct. Uh, you had the fact that it involved public officials, uh, foreign public officials. Um, but on the mitigating side, you had citation to uh, the exemplary cooperation, you know, the quote unquote exemplary cooperation that Airbus uh, engaged in, uh, which resulted in a, a reduction of the penalty by 50%. So, um, you know, the number is quite large, but, but could have been even larger. So one of the interesting things in the French resolution, Brian, was the, um, I don't want to say denial of a monitorship, but the judgment stating that a monitorship was not needed yet, there appeared to be ongoing oversight. Can you explain that perhaps not anomalous language or what, uh, what was really going on there? Yeah, so it's an interesting um, situation. Uh, you know, in, in France, under the French regime, when there is a monitorship, um, that is imposed as part of a, a resolution like this. The monitorship is actually um, performed by an agency called the AFA, and the AFA uh, was also created out of Sapandu uh, in late 2016. So unlike in what we're used to in the U.S., where a monitor is chosen uh, sort of jointly by the company and the Department of Justice, here the monitor uh, is the AFA. It is a, the French agency. Um, in in this instance, um, Airbus had actually already been under a control that was conducted by the AFA um, to assess their compliance program during the course of the investigation. So that took place during 2018. And the AFA had concluded that uh, Airbus had take, undertaken a significant amount of work and had developed and adopted and implemented uh, a robust compliance program. Um, in parallel, the company had also designated a panel of independent compliance experts, uh, one from France, one from the UK, and one from Germany, who had a sort of quasi-monitoring role as well while the investigation was, was being conducted. And so what we see is that there is a period of monitoring that is... Um, allocated to the AFA, but instead of doing a full review of the company's compliance program, they're going to engage in what they refer to as targeted audits of various entities or subsidiaries, uh, the idea being to see how the compliance program is being deployed uh, throughout the company. Um, so there will be some ongoing uh, monitoring and assessment, uh, and Airbus will um, will pay for that. They're, they're cited uh, to pay up to 8.5 million euros, um, but it won't be the sort of full scope monitoring that they would otherwise be subject to. Um, one, one point to note, coming back to the blocking statute, is that the reports that uh, the AFA provides will be provided first to the PNF, and then to comply with the blocking statute would be comply, uh, provided to their uh, counterparts in the U.S. and U.K., Brian, uh, in addition to this case just being massive in terms of scope, breadth, and certainly fine and penalty, it was also massive for the investigators. Uh, literally millions of documents, a joint task force set up by the Serious Fraud Office and the PNF. And I'd really like to focus on your views on the investigation portion of the PNF and really what this case might say about how the PNF has really stepped up into really the, the top ranks of investigative functions around anti-corruption across the globe. Yeah, I think it's it's very impressive um, to see from their perspective. Uh, you know, this is uh, an agency and a country that you know until fairly recently um, was perceived as not not doing um, so much in terms of investigating this type of conduct. Uh, and to see where they've come over the last several years is, is quite impressive. But I think it will um, help to, to calm some of the consternation here. Um, there's been a significant amount of discussion about the fact that um, French companies have been prosecuted by the U.S. authorities uh, in the past. 
and there was a view that you know France should retake a bit of its sovereignty in this respect. And so, seeing that the PNF is capable with their you know uh, judicial police counterparts to undertake this type of massive investigation and prosecution, I think will will give them uh, quite a bit of confidence and help to calm a bit of that uh, fervor that we've seen over the past couple of years. Brian, we've alluded several times in this podcast to just how massive this case was in terms of the breadth and scope of the bribery and corruption, the investigation, and certainly the fine and penalty. And one of the questions I'm getting from a lot of compliance practitioners is this case is so massive, they're really having difficulty getting their arms around it in terms of what are some of the lessons learned for a corporate compliance officer or a corporate compliance function. And I was wondering, from your perspective, could you give us uh, two or three key takeaways for the compliance practitioner? Sure. Yeah, well, in, it's true that the scale is is really, um, really unique here. But in some ways, um, some of the lessons are consistent with what we've seen in some other large corporate prosecutions. Um, you know, as one point, uh, the conduct here really focused um, almost exclusively on the use of commercial intermediaries um, who were paid, you know, success fees to generate sales. Uh, and so I think uh, that's further illustration of the need to really closely scrutinize that type of, of business partner, uh, not just doing sort of robust due diligence on the front end, but um, continuing to review their activities and monitor their activities on a, on a going forward basis um, to ensure they're actually performing bona fide services. Um, it also, I think, is further evidence of the, you know, continue, continually evolving uh, enforcement environment and the complexity that, that poses for multinationals, um, you know, ensuring that they have uh, an effective compliance program that's spread across their group, that's risk-based, uh, and that's subject to testing will be critically important uh, for them to be able to respond if issues come up uh, like this. And I think that's that's probably the final point, which is if there are issues, I think this, um, this settlement illustrates the importance of, you know, investigating them thoroughly. Um, when when these evidence and allegations came to light, uh, you know, Airbus was ultimately credited for undertaking a very extensive and thorough investigation uh, and for, you know, their ex- extensive cooperation, um, without which it's, it's quite possible this investigation could have gone on for, for many more years. Brian, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted more information on yourself or perhaps on the firm, where could they go? Sure. So I'd be happy to to go to our website, uh, which is www.hugheshubbard.com, uh, H-U-G-H-E-S-H-U-B-B-A-R-D.com. Uh, we have on there uh, the most recent version of our, our comprehensive FCPA alert, uh, which is completely free. So uh, be happy to have people um, check it out. And I will certainly give a plug for that alert. It was a, It's a great resource, uh, really detailed, both from the legal and compliance perspective. So I wanted to thank uh, you and the firm again for putting that out there, Brian. Um, thank you. The other thing, Brian, is uh, uh, with this case, I, I am hopeful that we will, you and I will be visiting more because uh, my other hope is that the French PNF and the French authorities will uh, really step up and use this uh, Bellwater case uh, to, or Bellwetter case rather, uh, to uh, continue their robust enforcement of French and our corruption laws. So thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I have done uh, multiple uh, blog posts and podcasts on the Airbus case. So check those out on the FCPA Compliance Report and blogging on the FCPA Compliance and Ethics blog. I hope you'll join me again next week where I take up another topic on compliance. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. I hope you'll take this opportunity during the coronavirus pandemic to listen to other podcasts on the Compliance Podcast Network 
We're going to be rolling out several new additions that I know you will find entertaining during these trying times. So check out the Compliance Podcast Network at www.compliancepodcastnetwork.net. Thanks again for listening.